So uh, with, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Guillermo Sapiro. So Guillermo Sapiro was born here in Montevideo, Uruguay. He received his bachelor, master's, and PhD degrees from the Department of Electrical Engineering at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. Uh, after postdoctoral research at MIT, uh, Sap Dr. Sapiro became a member uh, uh, of the technical staff of the research facilities of uh, HP Labs in Palo Alto, California. He was a professor at the University of Minnesota, and he's currently a James B. Brown, uh, B. Duke professor at Duke University. Guillermo Sapiro works on theory and applications of computer vision, computer graphics, medical imaging, image analysis, and machine learning. It's almost easier to say what he does not work on. So he is a fellow from IEEE, SIAM, and the American Academy of Art and Sciences. He has received a very large number of distinguished academic awards. So, and I know we all want to hear Guillermo, but before that, I want to say that it's a true honor for us to have him here at Faculta Ingeniería. So Guillermo works at elite universities in the United States, and essentially he can pick students from all, the, all over the world, wherever he wants, but he has been a champion of Latin American students. Just to give you an idea, seven or eight of the organizers of Kikupu have either done a, a PhDs, postdocs, or masters, or worked with him at some point in time. He has been very generous with his time, particularly with Facultad de Ingeniería. Long time ago with Professor Gregory Randall here, he began a collaboration that we hope will last for a long time. And I, I would like to say and close with this, that you know, many of you will work uh, here in Latin America, will be professors. Some of you will live and live abroad, but uh, maintaining, the, taking Professor Sapiro as an example of the way of maintaining collaborations and contributing either by coming and teaching courses, taking students, and so on. So please welcome Professor Sapiro. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the. So now he explained to you why I'm invited here, just because I have connections. So that's uh, the only reason I'm here. Uh, I just want to say, because you're going to see these wonderful uh, people that organize this, but you're going to miss one person. I just want to make sure that in case it wasn't mentioned yesterday, so one of the organizers, Mauricio de Brasio, he just left two weeks ago to Google Mountain View. So I just want to make sure that he gets the credit he deserves in spite of uh, not being here. His wife is going to return uh, to Friday, but I just wanted to mention. So it's an honor being here. And I'm going to be giving a talk today and a short talk on Friday. Uh, so let me just start uh, trying to see what this, this is all about. Uh, one of the things I learned when you work in medical, uh, immediately you have to make your disclosures of conflicts of interest and potential. So I've been fortunate to be funded by gifts from a number of foundations. Uh, half of them actually are supporting this conference because they're actually supporting everything that happens around, uh, but, uh, but uh, just I've been also fortunate. So let me just, uh, and, and I'm going to be here all week, so if we don't have time for questions, I will be happy to entertain uh, after that. So before we start, I want to just let you know, and I'm going to just run a video that we got a gift uh, uh, from one of the organizations I mentioned, from Amazon, they gave us a gift, and one of the things that they do, uh, we also got gifts from Google, Apple, and so we get gifts from everybody. We're fortunate. But they prepare a very nice video, and in particular, parents explaining what I'm going to be talking with you. And I think nothing better than them to explain that. So this worked before, the audio worked before. Let's see what happens. It's just three minutes. Grayson was our first child. We thought maybe something was a little bit off pretty early. We were told the wait lists for diagnosis with autism are really long, and I think they've only gotten worse from friends that I've talked to now. The computer can see things that the human eye simply can't see. A 
When I first started doing autism research, the average waiting time for a parent who's worried that their baby or child might have autism was about a year. And so the challenge was how do we come up with an app to be able to detect those early symptoms of autism, such as not making eye contact, not having normal facial expressions in a child's home. If a child is diagnosed at 18 to 24 months and provided two years of intervention, the average IQ gain is 17 points. So this has a huge impact on people's lives. And when I met Guillermo Sapiro, and he showed me that we could do what I've been doing in the clinic using a computer, that was an amazing moment for me. So I've been doing computer vision and machine learning basically all my life. Using computer vision and machine learning, we wanted to see if we could help create an automatic analysis of autism and autism spectrum disorder. Guillermo can use computer vision analysis to assess things like facial expression and attention. And so we built a set of movies that elicit these behaviors. And then we can show these on either a smartphone or a smart tablet and use the camera in the device to measure the child's response. Data gets sent off from the phone to the cloud, and then we would be able to analyze that data, run it through our algorithms to produce our estimates of where the person is looking at. Now that we have this tool, what we hope to do is combine the eye tracking data, the gaze data, along with the motion and jointly see if they can help in the assessment of the risk of autism. Families simply don't have access to the professionals that they need. The idea that we could use technology to increase access, that's just a wonderful thought to me. Every minute, every hour that you're able to, to implement those strategies that's helping your child learn that social development and learn it with you. And as a parent, that is really rewarding. Yeah. I think that if we can do just a small thing to change one kid, I think I would go to sleep with a smile. So, just to give you, so the person that was there, Jerry Dawson, she's one of the world, if not the world expert in autism, which is I'm going to be describing. The family we interview is Scott. Scott is the world expert in attention deficit disorder, and his son uh, has autism spectrum disorder, and they volunteer of their time and their beautiful home uh, to present to the public the challenges. So the outline of my talk, I'm going to just describe the challenge that was briefly described in the presentation. I'm going to tell you what we're doing. Uh, some of the results, we get more results. Uh, yesterday night, I was getting more and more results <laughs> uh, as we go. I'm going to explain why. But I, was, I also want to address why this is important, because it's not just, OK, let's just start using computer vision and machine learning to solve problems that affect humanity, but actually we were inspired by new problems in machine learning that we believe never existed before. And I'm going to try to mention some of them, uh, and which include some variations of privacy and fairness that are very much inspired by this time of problems. So I'm going to try to be on time, uh, but I, I thought it was worth showing that video. Uh, by the way, that video was just done by two people, and, and it's amazing how two creative people can do. And it got more views than all my entire papers and actually all Duke University papers together. Uh, uh, so, you know, that says something about science and good uh, uh, dissemination of science. So what's the challenge we're trying to confront? Uh, one every nine or 10 children have a developmental disorder. And developmental disorder in this case is they have something that impedes the performance at the level that they could do. So it's not compared to somebody else, it's compared to themselves. So they live life, uh, uh, children, they live life underperforming because that developmental disorder is not addressed. And we saw one example about the 17 points in IQ which actually moves them potentially to independence. And if you think one every 10 is exaggerated, just think your own uh, elementary school, and almost two in every classroom, which is basically the standard. 
And let me just give you a few other numbers. In the United States, one every 59 is diagnosed with, uh, with uh, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and I just, often I mention autism, but it's a di spectrum disorder. And actually the new numbers is one every 50, not one every 59. Uh, just another incredible number is that there is about half a billion children in sub-Sahara Africa and only 50 specialists. So this is not something that, oh, let's just pick a phone and call Bill Gates and ask him money to train another 10 doctors, 1,000 doctors. It just doesn't work. It's just not going to scale up. And the first time I presented this, uh, I actually, somebody, a doctor from, from where I live, uh, from Durham, Durham has the highest concentrations of MD PhDs in the country, in the United States, because we have three top universities, three hospitals, in just 15 min minutes radio. But somebody said, just get out of Durham area, which is called Triangle, and basically 70% of the counties don't have a specialist, so basically they have to send them to Duke or UNC or, or NC State if, if they're not there. So, it's a major challenge, uh, autism in particular, but developmental disorders in general. Still today, the way to diagnose, the way to treat, everything that involves autism and many developmental disorders is observation, behavioral observations. It takes a long time to train people to do that. They are very expensive, they are very time consuming in the clinic. And so basically there is not enough clinicians and there will never be enough clinicians. So it's not, oh, we, we just have a shortage. It will never be solved if, if we just go the old system. And the old system, it doesn't apply anymore to any disease. I'm working on developmental disorders. But, uh, but you can think about almost anything. And so basically, the, the current way of addressing this just don't scale. Um, what's the consequence? The consequence is that today you can actually diagnose autism at a year and a half of age. So 18 months to 24 months is the standard. That's possible today if you get to people like Jerry Dawson or our colleague or others. Once we have that science at a university, what is our tendency is always to push science b b further. So today, we actually started a project at Duke on being able to try to screen at six months. If we already know how to screen at 12, at 18 months, why don't you start earlier? And not just us, the National Institute of Health just financed five projects to start to move that to early ages. And also, we want to monitor how our treatments are working. So we know the science today, we want to push it to the future. But because of the lack of access, what's happening is the other way around. The average diagnosis in the United States today is close to five years old. Not a year and a half, five. Three times your life so far. So imagine that you have a disease at 50, and you have to wait until 150 to get access to the hospital. Because that's what's happening today for autism. Three times their life. The waiting times are over a year, as Jerry said, in most of the hospitals. So basically, when you're... Uh, when your baby is born, you better go and put them in the schedule for the hospital visit a year from them. So what we started to do, on, on, and then we are actually missing the best years of life, and I always say the same thing, uh, everybody sitting in, those, in this audience, I'm sorry, but you are not learning as fast as you used to learn. Actually, the fastest rate of learning is when we are two, three, four years old. It's about 700 million synapses per second. So we're missing an incredible opportunity, because not because we don't have the science. Of course, we don't have all the science, but we have much more science than what we are actually deploying. So what's our idea uh, for, with autism and developmental disorders is just get out of the hospital. And so, so this basically nonsense uh, thing that we have to go to the hospital. Netflix already understood a long time ago that you don't have to go to the movies, the movies come to you. So we need the technology and the assistance to come to them. What do I mean? I mean, it has to go to schools, it has to go to houses. That's where people live, that's where children live, so that's where it needs to go. I want them in the supermarket. In the United States, you go and, and measure your blood pressure in the supermarket, but you don't get a developmental disorder screening, which for me sounds uh, unacceptable today. And I want to go into planes. I always say the same, and, and I know there are people from companies here, so I'm going to see their product when they take this idea. Uh, 
people sit on the East Coast to West Coast for five and a half hours on a plane with nothing to do. Uh, uh, people go to the doctor for 15 minutes. So, so basically, I just gave you 20 times the time that a doctor uh, has to see you sitting on a chair on a plane. Uh, so we should be doing something about those five hours. And, and what we're trying to do is basically go to where the children are, where, go with the, where the people are. So we started working on, on a closed loop uh, computational behavioral phenotyping, and I'm going to give you a few examples of that. But the basic idea is that the child sits either in the waiting room in the clinic or in the clinic or at home or in the school and watches a movie. Uh, watches stimuli, which I'm going to show to you, that are very carefully designed to elicit things that we know reflect a, a, a potential risks for autism. Then while the child is sitting there, the camera and basically every sense of this device, this, okay, just came back. So uh, you guys are all very, very young, but, but this guy has the power of crazy supercomputers when they went out of business. Actually, I'm lying. iPhone 4 had the power of crazy supercomputers, okay? So this is 10 or 11, I don't know what. But this has incredible, uh, uh, just all the devices, the, the Pixel, the, the Samsung, they have incredible sensors, incredible cameras, incredible computer power, incredible screen. And we're trying to exploit that. So the camera is watching them. We're trying to do computer vision and machine learning, which I'm going to describe a few examples. And then we use machine learning to try to create data science. And, and just to give you an idea, in every single one of the examples I'm going to show you is the largest data set ever collected. And every time we do another study, that becomes the largest data set ever collected. We have basically tens of thousands of videos today uh, of, of children uh, playing with, with basically uh, uh, those apps. So these are just examples of the stimuli. They're moving real time. They're very slow because I uploaded the computer with three videos. They're all carefully designed. So if you take me aside and say, why did you do that? There's hundreds of papers in the literature that explain that that's a proper design to do. And you see we have social events, non-social events. We have toys. We have ducks appearing and disappearing. They all have a reason. They're trying to imitate what the expert will do in the clinic to try to elicit behavior of kids with autism. So they're not invented. They're actually trying to replicate. And we work very close as with Jerry. They say, this is what I would do. Can you just do it in the computer? And basically, let's just look at a, at a kid basically looking at one of them. OK, this has audio, but it's not coming out. But the, the, the bunny just made a noise, and she laughed. Thank you. And we're, we're tracking her behavior as a response to what's going on on the screen. And we're tracking it at 30 frames per second. So we know everything that she's doing. She's smiling, she's not smiling. Uh, at some point, you might have seen that she turned around and shared attention with a clinician that was back in the room. And that's very important, is sharing, switching attention and sharing attention. So that's basically Mark in the video what's happening. So 30 frames per second, just to give you an idea, when, when the kids go to the standard ADOS, which is the behavioral study, the clinician is counting normally in seconds, not at 30 frames per second, but it's counting 0, 1, 2. Uh, the front face camera of the old phones has 30 frames per second. The front, ca front face camera of the uh, new iPhone has 120 frames per second. So we're talking about speeds that have never been seen by clinicians and, and similar. I mean, we're using the iPhone for reasons I can explain, but so forgive me if I say iPhone, I'm not trying to advertise. I'm actually not allowed to advertise uh, as I work to a public, I win a nonprofit organization. But, but all the cameras are just incredible devices. So we basically can get information at levels I have never seen before. And so for, and we can get gaze. Not Toby, 120,000, 20,000, 30,000 devices, just the camera on the phone can get us gaze 
and that's a, the dot that is moving, and then those two stimuli are standard stimuli used in autism research. There is kind of a friendly face on the left and a, and a scramble of dots on the right. So they all have neuroscience behind them. And then we can go back and say, oh, the kids spend a lot of time looking at the right picture, and this is a heat map of that, instead of looking at the left picture. And those are all risk indicators of autism. They are not diagnosis, they are risk indicators, which is the main goal. So let me just tell you a couple of examples of things that we can do. For example, one of the most this is a question that happens when you go to behavioral studies and they ask parents and they do that. And one of the most uh, uh, telling risks of uh, autism in children is when the child is distracted and you call their name and you want them to stop doing what they're doing and pay attention. And this is universal. It doesn't depend on your culture. It's just 18 months old. If the mom calls, they turn around. And we do that on the app. So if you work on computer vision machine learning, and actually you saw that on the figure, you can call, you can either have a person or have a Bluetooth uh, speaker call, and the child turns around. We track them so we know they turn around. In about a five-minute session, so our, all our sessions that we're doing in the, uh, are between five and 10 minutes. In a five-minute session, we, we do this name calling three times. And then you get some interesting results. So, TD is the yellow, is typically developing kids, and ASD is autism spectrum disorder. So this is the first study we did. It's about 120 kids, which is already a very large study for that number. We are now doing a study with 7,000, 8,000 kids, more or less. But 120 was very large already at that time. This is a couple of years ago. None of the kids with autism so these are all kids in Duke Pediatrics. So they're not volunteers from the street. We just go, this is what's called an epidemiology study. You just go into the clinic and you take every kid that the parents allow them to participate. None of the kids with autism turn three times. None of them, zero. Okay? On the other hand, none of the typically developing kids did not turn at least one time. So. Now we're trying to replicate this with a large number, but that says that if you turn three times, according to this research, you don't have autism. If you don't turn any time, you do. It's a very, very strong biomarker. But moreover, if you look at the slides on the right, we were very curious what happens when the kid with autism actually turns. There were a couple of kids that turned one time, and there were a couple of kids that turned two times. And then we discovered something that was not known in the literature, thanks to the resolution. That even when the kids with autism are turning, they actually do that with delay. And the delay, so the distribution of the ASDs on the left and the distribution of the typical developing on the right, they're almost not overlapping. So when the kid wants to turn, does it with delay. And that delay might be a social or might be a motor reason. But it's a fact that they turn with delay. And once again, because we're doing 30 frames per second, it's not very hard to catch exactly when they start turning, when they finish turning, when they come back. So these allow us not only to replicate name calling, which was known in the literature, but also to find new things. Let me give you one more result, and I might need to run that twice while I'm explaining. There is a kid, this typically developing kid, observing that stimuli. And although the video is sped up, you, you actually see that it, it kind of maintains a very rigid uh, uh, head. And on the right, there is a kid with autism. So he's paying attention to the stimuli, but it's actually moving a lot while paying attention. On the bottom is the total energy of the movement. And this is just done, again, by tracking facial uh, things. So let me just run that, if I can, uh, run that again. Once again, this was not known. It was known for other ages and other uh, conditions, but not for kids. So we are tracking their face at 30 frames per second and seeing. Now, those of you that come from the other spectrum, not from children, but from actually neurological neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson, we say, wow, that looks pretty much like Parkinson. It's actually having this tremor. 
It turns out that there is tons of literature about uh, overlapping neurological uh, sources potential between autism and Parkinson's. So this will not surprise any of the neuroscientists that understand that. And this is called posture. It looks like uh, children with autism have a difficult time keeping a rigid posture. So this is just a couple of studies that we are doing, either replicating or providing new biomarkers. As I mentioned, we are now, we got what's called an autism center of excellence from the National Institute of Health. And we're running a study, as I say, seven, 8,000 kids. Basically, everybody in Duke Pediatrics uh, in four hospitals is coming. We have already uh, consented over 3,000 uh, uh, kids and already scanned, I think, about 1,000 or something like that that we have data. And these are 10 minutes uh, with 12 different stimuli. We also have games uh, now uh, in the system. Before we move into this large study, we had an impasse and we asked ourselves, if we are successful, will this be constrained to the clinic or we will be able to send this home and parents download? So we actually put an app uh, uh, on the web for people to download that have a, a, a reduced version of this. And it turns out that it works great. It turns out that parents take it. Parents give us tremendous videos. So basically, almost 90% of the frames we receive from parents basically are easy to analyze with computer vision and machine learning, which was surprising. We didn't know if people will even remember to turn on the lights. By the way, no instructions on the app. The only instruction is that picture you see there that says, sit your kid on your lap and just try to be in a quiet room. So very kind of modern today of not giving three pages of instruction. It has consent and all the legal stuff, but that's the whole, the whole instruction that we give to parents. And parents understood how to do it, and they managed. So it was clearly that I shouldn't say if. I say when we have complete the result and we are successful in the clinic, it will be ready for a, a distribution because the parents and caregivers are capable of doing it. So. Uh, as I say, be, before I go a bit into the challenges that we're confronting today, some of the challenges and open opportunities, uh, 9,000 participants is what we put in the proposal, uh, but we have a plus minus 1,000 because, you know, clinical research that happens. This is done inside the hospital. Parents come at 12 months, and we say, when you come back for your well checkup at 18 months, can you participate on this? And I say, now we're doing that at six months. So these are Duke patients that are coming. We are actually now expanding. I'm going to talk a bit more on Friday about that. We already run a study in South Africa, and we're going with another study in Ghana uh, in the next couple of months. So South Africa was within ship a doctor, which is ship two phones, OK, to get the same results that we can get at Duke. So, so that's where medicine is going and where medicine should be going. We're doing other things like eating disorders and neurological disorders, and I will be happy to discuss them. Uh, I'm not, uh, uh, this takes an entire village to do, and these are just some of the names. You will recognize a few because, like Matthias is from here, and a few others that are either were graduates or, 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 or were born here or some connections to this place. And you saw Jerry on the picture. It takes many more people like this. The Autism Center of Excellence has over 100 people involved. So before I go into the challenges, it's clear for us that we need to do this because of the scalable issues and access issues I mentioned. It's clear that it's possible. We're getting the results. Parents and home are participating. There are some very interesting privacy issues there, which I'm happy to comment. And, and basically, we can elicit in the phone or in a tablet or in the computer the same type of, of things that clinicians try to elicit in the clinic, which, which I find it quite amazing. So when we start doing this, there is two things. And both, I think, are legit. One is, we've been doing computer vision since the 60s, at least, as your Rosenfeld uh, in the 60s. OK? If we are so good as we claim we are when we go to CVPR, we should be able to deploy this into real scenarios. If not, just stop claiming you're good. OK? 
And this is a lot of that. It's just deploying things that we know what to do. And that's great, but also ask questions that were not completely asked before. And one of those is, you saw all these stimuli that are happening. I need to track the gaze. I need to track the attention of the child. And if you look at the literature, most of that is done in hospitals with Toby devices, calibration, crazy stuff that will never work, not for an 18-month-old, certainly not for a 6-month-old. So we propose, um, we actually challenge ourselves to do gaze analysis that works all the time with no calibration and on a phone. All the time. Not sometime, all the time. Okay? So 10 minutes, maybe you miss a few frames, but it has to work all the time. So we design stimuli that evoke gaze, but the stimuli are carefully designed. They're not crazy. You saw them, and I will be happy to show them again. They're like left, right, top, bottom. So they're very coarse. And we do that on purpose because we say, OK, I know I can track the landmarks. And if I distribute correctly gaze, stops being kind of a regression problem. And you're going to learn, if you're not familiar, you're going to learn those terms uh, soon. It's not about precision. It's a classifier. Are you looking left or right? I want that to work all the time. I don't care about one millimeter accuracy to work all the time. I want to know if you're looking to the left of the screen where the toy was, or to the right of the screen where the parent with her child were playing. So we transform the problem of estimation into a problem of classification. And we design a new algorithm that basically works all the time. Because it has an easier task, we design the stimuli to make the life of the algorithm easier. So that was one example of a new kind of machine learning challenge. The second was all the gaze tools in the community basically need calibration. You sit in front of the screen. There are many reasons, but one of the reasons they need calibration is because don't get too depressed about that, but your eye is not perfectly round. Okay? It doesn't have to say anything about you having problems. It's just eyes are not round, but these systems assume they are. So they assume a lot of reflection things that we learned that they're not true. So you need to calibrate them. But six months olds don't like to be calibrated. OK? So how can you do calibration without doing calibration? And it, calibration is needed. Actually, the, the, the workshop at ICCB last week or two weeks ago completely was about this. And calibration is needed. So here is computer vision to the rescue. Why don't you show, like the ducks, fun movie to the kid for about 30 seconds? 30 seconds means 900 frames. That means 900 calibration frames. But the kid doesn't know it's being calibrated. It's just watching very, very simple movies that have very clear places where the child is supposed to concentrate, like the duck, or like these two people talking. And then you use saliency maps from computer vision to provide non-accurate labels. They're not perfect labels. They are noisy labels. And then you take a deep learning, which you're going to start learning in half an hour. And you take a regular deep learning tool that knows how to do gaze, but without calibration. And you incorporate those noisy labels. And you get right away, in just less than 30 seconds, about 25% of improvement in your accuracy. The kid never knew that I was calibrating the kid. The kid just actually had a blast watching ducks for a few seconds. And that's another example of things that you, the, basically, the clinical challenge brings you. And, and you try to design new machine learning, not just apply the machine learning that exists, which is nothing wrong with that, of course. Uh, so that's another example. A third example, and this I'm going to be brief because I, I, I realize it always takes me time to, to explain. But, but there is something very peculiar in machine learning that is almost the only thing. So that's very, when we talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence, this is really not how humans work. So we all know, and there's going to be a lot of discussion about mistakes that AI and machine learning makes. 
What's interesting, and there is a, a bit of literature now, is that machine learning is very much all or nothing. So I take a picture of, of Nacho here, and either I say Nacho or I say uh, Gregory. Even if the picture is really bad and blurry, if it's blurry, what the computer would say, should say is, I know it's a male, but I don't have enough information to tell you anything else. But I'm telling you something that I can infer, and that's exemplify there. And also on that track, if I give you a track, machine learning should say it's a vehicle. Oh, and by the way, I know enough, so it's not a car, it's a truck. If you blur the track, machine learning tells you it's a cat. Instead of telling you a more hierarchical fashion, we call it a more nested fashion, and some papers in the literature are starting to do that, instead of telling you what I can tell you and stop. So that's how a doctor works. You come to the doctor, they measure your blood pressure, and they say, okay, you have one of these 23 things. Let me do one more test. You have one of these 10 things. And at the end, they might say, you have one of these three things, and I don't know which one. Machine learning will tell you, will make a mistake because it will try to go to all the way. Similarly, at training, if I get a sharp image of Nacho or a blurry image of Nacho, both of them should not be equally used in training my machine learning. But today, standard, again, there are exceptions, they are doing that. So we came with a technique, and I don't know if somebody's going to teach about units. Uh, during this week, but it's a fantastic uh, uh, framework that is basically done at DeepMind, although it wasn't done at DeepMind. They grabbed him, and now it's done at DeepMind. Uh, it's a fantastic structure of shrinking information and expanding information. So we design an uh, extension of new units that can be trained with different qualities of data, and different regions will be trained differently, and also can actually stop when you're testing it at the moment that says, this is all I can tell you. It will not wait and make a mistake. And that's, again, very much inspired by the clinic. Let me just give you a couple of additional examples. And I'm going to skip this, but as I say, I'm here. I'm just trying to, as a first, just trying to warm you up and say, OK, it's going to be worth spending 12 hours here for five days, because you're going to get details on all this. Otherwise, you, know, you might go to the beach. It's that way. <laughs> so this is a problem that was 100% inspired by the clinic. So I don't know how it works in the place where you're coming from. In the United States, when you do clinical research, there is an organization inside the university it's called Institutional Review Board, IRB. They have to approve your research. We are very good at that. We are very ethical. So they normally approve our research right away. But they ask us a question. I didn't mention to you, but when we deploy the app for people to download from iTunes, we allow them to upload the videos or to allow only the landmarks. Most of them uploaded the videos. But the idea to upload the landmarks was that we are going to preserve their privacy if they wish to. IRB say, can you guarantee that you are preserving the privacy? Can you guarantee that from those landmarks, you will not be able to infer who that child is? And I'm going to repeat the question. I'm going to stress. They say, can you guarantee? They didn't say, can a hacker sitting in a basement in Bangladesh do it. They ask me, because the hacker is a security problem of the hospital to make sure they don't steal my data. They wanted to make sure our tools are not capable. Our tools sit in the hospital, so they have control over them. I mean, we upload our software to the hospital machines. We don't run them in our machines. So we ended up developing with two students from here, Martina and Natalia, a system that does the following. You take an image, it filters it, and it gives you another image that you can keep doing what you wanted to do with it, and you block the machine learning that is trying to do something that you didn't allow machine learning to do it. And we can do very crazy stuff with that. But basically, when you upload your videos to us, 
they get filtered in a way that I might be able, for example, to infer if you are turning your head. Remember, I need your landmarks. But I won't be able to infer if you are a male or female or if you are smiling or not, if that's what you want me to stop from doing. But they didn't ask if any system and side information. They basically say if we can do it. And we design a system based on adversarial training and, and information theory that basically says, I want to make sure that for the utility that I want to infer, the mutual information before and after is the same, so you don't lose information. But for the privacy, basically it looks like you're prior. It's random. And we designed that system. We have bounds that explain when we can do it. So we ended up doing math because of a question that a group that is considered by most a bureaucratic organization actually ask a very smart question. I actually don't consider them a bureaucratic. I think it's a great organization. And let me just give you examples. So the bottom, the bottom there is the original and the filter image. And basically, the filter images, I can induce the gender, but I cannot induce their emotions. The top image, I can basically induce the, their identity, so I can match them without knowing if they're a male or a female. The one on the right here, it's a bit harder to explain, but when we open our phones with our face, the people behind us are also captured, and that's a major violation of privacy because I didn't authorize the people at Starbucks to be captured with my phone, but they are. So we design a system that filters and filters the owner of the phone and blocks out the non-owner of the phone. So if you are the owner of the phone, it does something, it makes you yellowish, I'm not so sure why, but the phone can still recognize you. But if you are unauthorized, it just blacks you out. So, so we, but it's the phone. That doesn't mean that those images will not be recognized by another phone, but not by other, our phone. So it's a much more controlled scenario, which makes privacy a bit easier. So my clock there stopped, but how am I doing? Oh, then I'm fine. So. Let me just tell you the last thing, and we're going to talk about that. Do, I know there is a great talk about privacy and security on Thursday, and there's an entire session, uh, I'm sure, on, the, on, on Wednesday on the other health talk. They for the people in Bangladesh that are watching. <laughs> so, oh, but, uh, so when you're talking about health, and when you're talking about health of children being recorded in their home, that's very private. And that's why we're very concerned about privacy. Another part that is very important is fairness. And this is a, another challenge, because there are some diagnosis and some screening that actually work better on certain populations than others. And sometimes it's because of bias of the data, sometimes it's because of other reasons. But that's a fact. And one of the easiest ways, and that has been mostly studied in the fairness community, is to hurt the class that you're doing better. So here is the example. I'm not going to name a company, but almost every company has a big gap on pay between male and female. Almost anyone I know. They're all trying to work hard. So let's say that females are $20 and males are 25 In order to be fair, they're shrinking the male to 20 And then you become perfectly fair. So what you're doing is you add noise to the class. That's the easiest way. It's not the only way, but it's an easy way. That doesn't work in medicine. If you're bad in diagnosis certain class, you don't want to hurt the other class so you're more fair. And then it will be better to increase the female to 21, decrease the male to 23, for example. Still have a gap, but both of them actually got better. And who decides if that gap is acceptable is a policy. It's not the goal of the machine learning. The goal of the machine learning is to give the tools. So we are now working with uh, Martina and Natalia on a system that basically is called do not harm fairness. And the idea is that using tools from, from computational economy, from economic theory, which is called the Pareto boundary, we give you the best solution 
that didn't do extra harm to any of the classes that you have. And we tell you how fair or unfair is that solution. But we say, this is the best you can do. More than this, you're going to start creating harm in those classes. And the second step is that not only that's the best you can do, but if you want perfect harm, what we just gave you is your starting point. Perfect fairness, not perfect harm. Sorry, thanks. If you want perfect fairness, you start from what I told you. So we end up quantifying, and I'm not going to go through this, but we find, we find the Pareto boundary, so the points that are optimal from the point of view of do not harm. And from those points, either you stay there or you project onto the line of perfect, of perfect fairness. And it's your policy decision what of the two or any intermediate to do. And once again, we have some interesting bounds and some interesting theory that once again is motivated by health that says do not harm is a very important challenge. And as I say, I'm sure there will be more discussions this week. So these are examples of things that basically are motivated by the time of AI for health that we are doing, some directly motivated, some indirectly, and some hopefully apply beyond what we are doing. So let me just finish because I hope or I assume that 90% of the people in the audience are students and not all people like me, that we have been, it took us a long time. Uh, I would be more than happy to share all the proposals that were rejected when we started this work on autism. Now we are very well funded, but it took us time. But people often ask us, what are recipes for success? So let me just spend my last two minutes about telling you, until now it was science. It's objective. There is no discussion we can stand behind. The next three slides are my personal opinion. Maybe I should ask the cameras to be off, so I'm not quoted. But it's my personal opinion. This is almost fact. How we used to do machine learning for health. We have a great researcher sitting in front of a computer. We have great doctors. They don't talk with each other. Zero conversation. The doctors upload the images to some place. The AI people download the images. They run their fantastic algorithms. And they then claim that they're superheroes because they got great performance. And that model still exists today, but it's shrinking significantly thanks to great leaders in the community that are working very hard. I don't want to tell you how hard we work to run a clinical study in a pediatric clinic. Let me just give you one example, and I applaud my clinicians. What do you think happens when an 18 months old comes to the clinic to play with a phone? These are fun, but they come with a sibling. What do you think the sibling wants? To play with the phone. So how do you solve that problem? You have to have babysitters, toys. You have to entertain the sibling. What happens with, have you guys ever been to a clinic that is quiet? We are recording audio, and we want to know if the kid is doing ba 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 or boo boo and with all the noise around. So it's challenging, but we try to do it. And there are a lot of people working. So that's the standard, I think, very wrong model that used to be and is disappearing. So how, what's the recipe for success? I have no clue. I have no idea. But I know the recipes for failure. And that's my personal slide at the end. Very personal slide. I have no clue success, otherwise I will become a paper factory and having one success story after another. One is that very often you have no clinical scientists in your AI team and not AI person in your clinical team. So I have seen outstanding clinical scientists, great doctors publish machine learning papers because they think that they download UNET and it works. And what they report is nonsense. And I have seen the other way around I'm going to laugh a bit about Mar, more about that. Very often, the metrics we in the machine learning use are not very relevant for the clinic. OK? I don't know what's the age for do a colonoscopy in Uruguay. In the United States, it used to be 50. Now it's 46. 
And I had a discussion with a doctor when he was 50. The doctor believed that male do not get cancer, colon cancer, before the age of 50. Why? Because you don't have to be screened. If the insurance company tells us you don't have to be screened, it's because you don't get cancer. So I have to explain to her, I went to the board, I have to explain to her what's a Gaussian distribution intersecting with the Pareto curve of optimal uh, economics, and she looked at me like I was talking not my language or her language. The metrics that we find in the hospital are not the same metrics we're used. Doctors give us bad radiology images, not because they're stupid, it's because they only got five minutes to get that image. So you know what? Machine learning person, go and deal with that five minutes image. Don't tell the doctor, give me a better image. They won't, because they can't. So we are not very aware of their challenges, and this goes in both directions. And every time I see a really successful project on, on AI and health, it's because they do this. And this is my personal, please stop AI people telling you're doing superhuman performance. Please stop, because that's wrong. That's disrespectful to the humans, which we are, and we're still way more intelligent, but it's actually scientifically wrong. Because the humans do that with constraints that the computer doesn't, okay? And when you get into the, comp into the hospital system, you're gonna see how your, human, your superhuman performance starts going very down because you break the model. And this is my personal to young people, please do not worry too much about publishing in NERIPS, ICML and all, please worry about doing good science and the publications will come. The goal is not to publish, the goal is to do science, contributions to humanity, and the publications will come. I guarantee you that they will come. Some bad papers get published. Good papers always get published. Okay, so just don't worry about publications. And I can say because I'm a tenure full professor, I don't care. So I'm, I'm sorry about that, but, but don't worry. Just worry about doing good science, which is fun. So machine learning brings you a lot of interesting problems. Machine learning brings, and this is gonna be a Friday, if you do AI for health, you're automatically doing social good. And I wanna finish with the last part, which is very interesting, uh, and the people here, so this is my last uh, uh, comment. We're all very worried about the uh, lack of diversity very often in machine learning. It's very interesting, diversity I mean that there's not enough females doing machine learning. It's very interesting that that doesn't happen if you are doing AI and health, and certainly doesn't happen if you're doing health. If you go to those conferences, they're naturally much more diverse. And I think it's because when you work on interesting problems, diversity comes. Because we humans are, care about interesting problems. I wouldn't be surprised if your goal is to create a great system that differences between a cat and a dog that you might not have diversity. If you wanna cure cancer, I can guarantee you, you're gonna have diversity in your team. Thank you very much. I, did, I didn't read what you put there, but. Oh, six minutes yeah. for questions. Okay, how do I do the questions? So, let's start with a question from the floor. There is a, do I pick them or you pick them? You pick them. Okay, I, I pick according to the first hand I see and I don't run a first system in my head, so <laughs> whatever I see first, yes. I will repeat the question, so. Oh, very well question. So how do we start, particularly with people, are you referring to clinicians or? Lot of work. Every Wednesday, entire morning. The f it starts for years. What I show you now is years of conversation, but the basic, maybe I'm gonna say, the necessary condition is 
they were interested, we were interested. So we spent a lot of time just communicating and learning the languages, a lot of time doing that until we converge onto, onto how technology can help them. They want to do crazy things that technology, because they read the New York Times like everybody else, and they believe AI has solved everything. <laughs> they are completely, I, say, I read on the New York Times that you can actually say if you, if you wake up a bit tired, say, yeah, please don't read the New York Times anymore, the science section at least. So they come with that, and I come, I'm a superhuman. Just tell me a problem. <laughs> Three years, we got into head turning. Simple things that are very important for them and relatively easy for us to do compared to discovering if you wake up tired or not. Just dialogue, just dialogue and dialogue and dialogue. We, I literally at the hospital about 10 hours a week now talking with them. Oh, I don't know. I have to, I'm privileged. I, I work at a university where the people, I, I need to stop them from coming. So that's my privilege. I'm, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Guillermo, remember to repeat the question. Oh, that one I think I repeat, but if not, I'm gonna try to remember now. I can repeat the question, just. Uh, you, he can repeat the question. Yeah. Yes. How do you deal with the, the trustiness from the clinician on your, your industry? Like, how do you make sure that the clinician was not trusting too much on these to make the diagnosis? Okay. Great question. So the question is, how do we are doing screening or risk assessment? We're not doing diagnosis. Certainly not at this moment. We can discuss in the future. And then your question is, how do we trust? how the clinician will trust. First, the clinicians are part of our team. And second is publications and data to show them. So we have entire system that basically gives back and explainable AI is gonna be a topic this week. We can tell them how we give this risk assessment. So the two people in the video are world experts. They will not let anything go through unless it's not acceptable to them as a complement to their expertise. This is never to replace them, it's just to increase access and feasibility. But it's just doing solid science. You do solid science, you explain to the community, you come to talks like this, we go to the big autism conference every year, and we actually get our credibility because we publish what we think is good science. And then when, when Jerry says this is working, everybody's gonna listen because she's the top autism person in the world, so if she says something, people are gonna listen, and then, as I said, we are propagating to other hospitals to be a bit less. By the way, Jerry cannot do a data analysis, just to give you an idea of how we keep the ethic. She has no clue about the data. She's not doing data analysis, so she cannot indirectly bias data. She's not doing that. She receives the results, so we do these kind of things to make sure that we're doing things correct. But it's a great question, it's a challenge. Okay, so, we, so the idea is how we expand, and there, there are legal and not legal way of doing that, but it's once again, it's through credibility and voice. In the United States, there is, of course, there is FDA approved, but there's also standard of care. Standard of care is actually when you publish things that the literature supports you, and doctors can start incorporating if legally they can do that, so it's, yeah. So our app was, got a lot of PR from, from one of the large companies, so, so that's why people find out. So, so we have a question from the, the online Bangladesh. system. Bangladesh. Yeah, on the, <laughs> the online system, and is, are you planning to release some of the data that you're using? Great question. Uh, everybody that does research in autism in the United States has by mandate to release some of the data, the data that doesn't break privacy. So we are releasing that data, and then you're gonna ask me, how about the videos? So now for all the Googles and Amazons and Microsoft in the audience, here is something that we're starting to do. What if I deposit the data on the cloud, and you can trigger it without never seeing it? And that's what we are starting to do with one of the three that I mentioned, and I'd be happy to discuss, to put the data on the cloud, use all the privacy 
that the people in the cloud are doing. And then you might be able to upload your algorithms and run on our data, but you will never see the data. So you have access to this data, but I'm preserving the privacy. So that's a great point, and we are working on that. Very good. Um, do we have time for another question? No. No. All right. So thank you very much. All thank Guillermo Sapiro.